Hi everyone, just getting set up. Make sure I don't have any auto loop. <coughs> All right, let's see. Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. Push this over here. Okay. Hello, everyone. Apologies for the background noise. Uh, Nonpass. It's a uh, Sarah band. Um, think by handle. Just doing some window management here. Don't need that. Don't need that. Don't need that. All right. Love that chat. Love this chat. All right. <coughs> Hello everyone, welcome to Algebraic Topology. I think everyone's here. So, see everything set up. This, this. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, uh, seven JV. That's um. The noise I live by. All right. <clears throat> uh, yeah, Space Kitter. Um, it possibly is lagging a fair bit. That's my computer not being a massively powerful rig. So, how is the audio? Um, video may be a bit shonky, but if the audio is clear, um, then it's not going to be so bad. Quicker to me, just um, check here. Okay, excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> and yes, that's a massive lag. <laughs> uh, so I do apologize if my answer is uh, slow uh, because, uh, Chris, I don't mind either. Um, either a discord or or twitch chat yeah so sorry about the slow motion video if the university was throwing money at me to buy a decent uh, personal computer at my house uh, it would be great <coughs> okay so uh, oh one thing to, left to do. Where did it go? I believe. Um, so everything will be a whole lot smoother in uh, future starts. This is the first lecture, so we're here, we're here. Is that it? This one. Just one moment while this opens up. Hopefully, just the thing that I want. Okay, hopefully, that fits on the page. screen share what is this okay <clears throat> so just before we start and acknowledge the uh, the Ghana people on whose land I'm presenting from at least 
and some other participants are here in the Adelaide Plains and I acknowledge the, uh, the elders past, present and emerging. And I will get rid of that, not chat. This is my highly technical solution. Um, um, Wei Yang, I'm not sure about that oh, screen flashing. That wouldn't be great. <coughs> All right. So we're ready to go. Hopefully most of you have had a chance to look at the uh, the welcome intro video. Um, I've put it up on in an announcement on Canvas. Uh, Tyson, yes, it's it's a bit annoying. Um, I'm going to roll with all what we've got. Oh, okay, even worse. Let's see, I want to kill that, some more things, I forgot to close all those down, there. Um, so we could try just um, Twitch chat, because then uh, Discord won't be hogging memory. <clears throat> so I'm just going to close Discord, um, is anyone on Discord who's not on Twitch is going to be super inconvenienced. I'll just double check. Uh, it's not a Zoom meeting. I'm just using it as a screen share because of uh, reasons of technology. No one's in the Zoom meeting. All right. Has a video picked up any any much? Um. Yeah, I mean, it would be nice to have my face. Uh, let's uh, do this. I'll do that. Alright, well, I've killed the Zoom webcam. Alright, I might just proceed. Um, everything will be written, it's recorded. If the audio is fine, uh, you can at least listen and. Um, Nothing's going to be too dynamic. I mean, I'm writing and <clears throat> you'll see um, PDF scans of my notes after the lecture in any case. So, to begin. All right, so the first thing I want to recall is The Euler characteristic of a polyhedron characteristic of a polyhedron. Right, so let's call it P. So the Euler characteristic chi of P. So Maybe should say it's a finite polyhedron, but let's just remember polyhedron in the naive sense. <coughs> so the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces. 
and you know the typical things we think about are tetrahedron cube um, <clears throat> we're going to have any kind of polyhedral pyramid what else here yeah. so all these type of things and it's a theorem which you roughly to Euler at least stated by Euler um, proved more or less by Cauchy and then well fixed up by a bunch of people because rigor in 1800 wasn't great is that Euler characteristic is two ah okay sorry that's needs to be pulled over here all right thanks Juven um, I'll think about that I've got a Mac um, and it's fun to try to play around with software for a given definition of fun so thanks Tess for pointing out that the writing is cut off I think it should be okay also there's an RON there <coughs> And that's not that's that's the limitations of the screen okay all right so <clears throat> the only characteristic is two right and so why is this all right all of these all of um, they are basically a sphere um, <clears throat> If we have a torus, say, so we'll say other triangulated surfaces. Um, so these aren't technically all tri triangulated, right? So cube is not triangulated. Uh, this pyramid is not triangulated. Uh, but we can, within reason, Assume everything is triangulated. Throw in some extra edges. <clears throat> All right. So what's what's the next best example of a triangulated surface? Um, say a torus. Oh, and I might put triangulated here in quotes. So let's cut it up. Like so, so it's it's stitched together. So it, and we draw another edge on the inside of the donut. So it has two faces shaped like rectangles. Uh, we could triangulate, actually triangulate this if we want to cut those in half um, at the cost of adding uh, an extra edge, multiplying the number of faces by two. <coughs> Um, it has four edges, two vertices. So then the Euler characteristic is zero. All right, so we just get a number which tells us that somehow these uh, these polyhedra that look like spheres are different in some sense to the torus. However, it's not a very strong, strong invariant. It's not a very strong tool that will allow us to figure out, um, you know, things that are different. All right. So there's nothing saying that our polyhedron needs or surface needs to be connected. Right? So, so what if, right, let's take the surface, which is the disjoint union of a sphere and a torus. 
let's triangulate them or cut them up however we like. So the surface is whatever's inside this dotted box. And now the coiler characteristic is still equal to 2. So not only does it it fails to detect that uh, what we've got isn't a sphere, it, it can't even tell that we're not they're not a connected surface. Um, so that's the thing you can do and, thing, and we'll come back to how we can enrich things. So um, what else? We have other dimensions. So we can let's say we have some kind of way of uh, cutting up our space, whatever it is. So the Euler characteristic is defined to be uh, a sum over dimensions, signs, or whatever our d-dimensional faces are. Um, yeah, <clears throat> and so this can't tell us anything about dimension because we can take a graph for instance uh, or we could take um, some three-dimensional thing that's glued together out of cubes and so we just get a single number so what but we should think about what is this this chi is somehow a function from spaces up to whatever it means to be the same so if we take a triangulation and refine that triangulation then uh, it's it's not too difficult to prove that you get the same number so it passes down to equivalence classes here so you get a function and so this is the very first sort of um, shadow of algebraic topology but a really weak one Okay, so here's the key idea. Let's pop this in. Okay, idea. Due to Emmy Nerta. Um, roughly the mid 1920s. She um, gave a talk about um, commutative algebra and if you look you could look at the abstract that's been published um, just as a throwaway line at the end she says oh and by the way this is useful for algebraic topology so apparently she expanded a bit more on the idea <clears throat> so what is the key idea um, if you want to replace numbers by the, say, abelian group groups of which they are the rank. Um, so they also had other invariants at the time. So we're not talking about Euler characteristic here specifically, but they had just collections of numbers which were refinements of this idea. So roughly just these numbers here, just sort of counting d-dimensional information. So we're going to go better than that. Um, so then, given this key idea, in map of spaces, give a, oh, <clears throat> I say homomorph, um, no, I say a linear map say Z linear, sorry, no, a homomorphism of abelian groups. Because there's no way to um, relate Euler characteristics to different spaces. They're just, they're just numbers. And this is really linearization. So what we do is take some nonlinear space, cook up an abelian group, 
and then a map of spaces, which can be any kind of random, non-linear, combinatorial, whatever, it gives a linear map. So something like, oops. <clears throat> so we get space. I mean, you might say vector space, right? E.g. This goes vector space. And then a continuous map gives us a linear map. Um, so one thing it's not enough to do like just take the vector space which is the number of vertices its dimension is the number of vertices uh, because then uh, like a tetrahedron and a cube which are roughly both like a sphere you get a different vector space but you want to actually get the same uh, the same vector space up to isomorphism so these are different they're both same as a sphere um, <clears throat> all right so it makes us go back and think how do we uh, encode um, spaces how do we encode triangulations anyway right if I draw a tetrahedron then or you physically handle a tetrahedron you kind of get an idea about what it is doing but if I want to encode one abstractly, then how do I do it? <clears throat> All right, so big note. I mean, I've been drawing cubes and so on. We're not going to use squares, cubes in this course. All triangles all the way. So, any questions? Um, do just fire them off in the chat because um, I can just incorporate it into the flow. So that's, that's sort of the first question. And this is really what the whole first section of the course is about, is how do we answer this question? <clears throat> so one thing you might think, if you've... Ah, oh, okay. So we skip it. Um, So you can take a sphere and triangulate it in different ways. So you can triangulate a sphere using a, a tetrahedron, or you could triangulate it. Well, you can cut it up as a cube. You can imagine drawing the lines of cube on the sphere, and then additionally, that's like cut each face in into a triangle <clears throat> and so then you have uh, 12 triangular faces whereas a tetrahedron has four and so you started with a sphere and you cooked up instead of a number like the Euler characteristic which is now same for all things that look like a sphere you've got something that's sensitive to the triangulation so that's a bit too sensitive Right, sometimes, I mean, we're going to see it's important to um, remember this information, but it's 
too sensitive and also it doesn't help um, if you're triangulating a surface with an infinite number of triangles because um, you can have an infinite number of triangles but still have um, some finite dimensional vector spaces coming out so this is kind of only a halfway like this is only a halfway step right it's 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 not enough yeah so it should only be uh, measuring sort of topological information not combinatorial information so, yeah. so before that we have to even think about what a triangulation is So, oops. So one way to do this, say, so have an incidence matrix. Uh, so you have a set consisting of all the um, vertices and edges and faces, and <clears throat> yeah, say so there's there's k things. Yeah, Luke, that's exactly right. What I was saying in, um, without trying to mention the word homeomorphism. Um, yeah, and feel free to jump in and answer other people's questions in the in the chat if you like. Nicely, um, because there are no stupid questions. Yeah, so an incidence matrix, say we've got k, k um, vertices, edges, faces, whatever, all together, order them, and we can have a matrix, say with a 1 in a position, that says this edge is incident with this vertex. But that's not great. Um, so here's a better way to do it. Not just, well, not that. We have just the incidence between adjacent dimensions all right so <clears throat> as example one let's take a field in triangle and I mean, everything's going to be oriented for this course for reasons I'm not really going to go into it helps right, so let's say we've got this field in triangle with an oriented boundaries and I'm going to orient the face this way <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is have two types of incidents so I'm going to have vertex to edge incidents Um, so something like it's three vertices, three edges. I'm going to put the vert. I'm going to number the vertices zero, one, two. And so let's just call them v zero, v one, v two. I'm just going to label the columns here and the edges. I'm just going to call them zero, one, zero, two, and one, two, corresponding to which. Um, vertices they go between and we just fill it in and I'll explain what I'm doing so minus and zero zero no, not it. okay so what's happening here I've got a one in a position if the edge is pointing to the vertex and I've got a minus one if the edge is pointing out of that vertex all right so vertex vertex v0 uh, my edge 0 1 0 1 here is pointing out of v0 and edge v0 2 is pointing out all right so now vertex 1 uh, edge 
0, 1 is pointing into vertex 1, and then edge 1, 2 is pointing out of vertex 1. All right, so that's the rough idea. <clears throat> and then we get edge to face incidence, and now we've got one face. So I've got edges 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3. And what I want is a 1 if the orientation of the edge agrees with the uh, orientation of the face. So edge 0, 1 is in going around the face this way is in the same direction. Same with edge 1, 2, but edge 0, 2 is opposite. So it's 1, minus 1, 1. Um, so let's just call this D0 as a matrix in D1. Okay, is that clear? Pull this from a dramatic effect. So this, in fact, gives us two linear maps. Okay, D banner. Um, <clears throat> so what we do is we have um, a matrix where the columns are labeled by, say, n-dimensional uh, things. So say vertices or edges. And then the rows are labeled by the n plus 1 dimensional things. So here it's the edges, so vertices to edges, and here it's uh, edges to the face. There's just one face. Uh, 0, 3. Well, that's a typo. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, we're working mod 4. <clears throat> or mod 9, maybe. Um, yeah, and so we have a, a plus 1 if the orientations agree, and a minus 1 if the orientations are opposite. grumpy people outside. Okay, so I'll do another example slightly more non-trivial. Give myself a bit more space. Actually, I'll pop this over here. Alright, so that's a prototypical example. If you can memorize this, you're, you're, you're going well. But I will just note, right, I just, first I just give matrices, which is somehow like an incidence matrix, but then uh, this gives a linear map, right? even if you just think of it as combinatorial information. So what does it do? It gives us... Um, number of vertices. And then a second map. Like so. So I'm going to make the following observation. So this appears mildly unmotivated. Um, so either you can just calculate it, or you notice that, um, for instance, the orientation on the edge 0, 2 I'll get to that one moment, Jivan. The, the orientation here 
being opposite to the orientation of the face <coughs> means the fact that the, the the way the orientations agree coming out of V0 will cancel each other out. So that's a massively hand wavy explanation. But you know we're we're counting V0 once for this edge and once for this edge, but these edges have different orientations, so the two versions of V0 cancel out in some some way. Um, so the choice of the orientations um, it's not arbitrary. The orientation of the edges, I mean, I'm labeling them 0, 1, and the vertices 0, 1, and 2, and the edge orientations are sort of increasing index. And then if you place um, pretty sure the orientation on the face is sort of the thing you get in the plane if you think of this as being in the plane in a natural way I, I haven't thought about that so hopefully that's not that's a small amount of motivation but in some respects this is the starting point um, if we believe this one then you can build up to the rest uh, in a fairly motivated way. All right, so second, second example. I think. Okay, this is a little bit bigger. So example two. Again, I'm labeled my vertices starting at zero. And my edges will be labeled by the vertices they go between. They're orientated in increasing index. Three. Uh, and the faces have the same orientation relative to their vertices as example one. So for instance, this face here is a 0, 1, 2 face is orientated that way. So I'm just going to write down uh, the corresponding matrices and that's something we can sort of think about a little bit afterwards. So let's write down, so we've got um, four vertices, six edges and four faces. I'm going to call this delta zero and delta one. And so delta zero, right? So the columns will be labeled by vertices and the rows will be labeled by edges. So let me just write in the, uh, the, the labels, get everything lined up. One, three, two, three, minus one. One, all right. Uh, the zero two edge is not misoriented, and the zero three edge is fine because they are 
pointing from the smaller uh, vertex label to the larger vertex label. Yeah, so they, the edges are not oriented induced by the orientation of the surface. It's really the other way around. The edges are oriented from the vertices and we're working up. Yeah, so it's not even just the numbers, it's from the lower dimensional things to the higher dimensional things, but it's a good question. Um, D me at D M N. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so all of this is relative too. All right, so we're looking, say, you know, at 2, 3. I, I don't have a 3 in my example 1, but I should think of 3 as just being the highest index. And then all the faces sort of work the same, right? So 1 is the lowest index of the 1, 2, 3 face, the 2 is the next highest, and the 3 is the next highest. So this this face is somehow flipped or rotated relative to this picture. I should think of this one as being the same as V0. All right, <clears throat> now quickly fill in this one. Oh, I didn't, this is, I should, colors. Zero one two zero one three zero two three one two three and I'm gonna have a massive matrix here. One one zero zero. I right, say so edge zero one sits between faces zero one two and 0, 1, 3. And both of those orientations of those faces um, agree with the orientation on edge 0, 1. So this is the corresponding matrix. Delta one. Okay. All right, so here's a thing as an exercise. This is the zero matrix. So this is, yeah, it's a mechanical calculation. There's a conceptual sort of underlying thing about how the orientations work. So, a second observation. So, observation. Two. Is that when you have a pair of linear maps that compose to the zero map, or the zero matrix. It means the image, the range, say, of D0 has to be inside the kernel of D1 and the image delta 0 is inside the kernel of delta 1. So this will become our friend. 
all the cores. All right. Any comments, questions? Well, I prime up the next bit of material. Leave it there for just one moment. <clears throat> so one thing to note is that these matrices, in fact, I mean, I've been writing R here, like real numbers. I could have written Z, it was still all makes sense, right? In fact, I could have written any R module for R, an arbitrary ring, and these matrices would still work. Even if, for instance, we had minus one equal to zero. Like, um, you know, we did it over the field Z mod two. Uh, observation one. zoom back in so I can annotate this with color so what am I doing so <clears throat> so vertex V0 is incident with edge 0 1 And also with edge zero two, and in a positive way, right? It's it's Chris. Shh. Spoilers. Um, <clears throat> right. So there's so the edge zero one and edge zero two are both coming out of vertex v zero, but edge zero two is oriented opposite to the orientation of the face of the triangle so sort of this <coughs> we get a minus one and a minus one but when we then go to look at how edges are incident with faces edge zero one and edge zero two have opposite orientation so despite both of these being minus ones, when we compose with the next one, edge zero one and edge zero two have opposite orientations. So these cancel out. We get plus this, minus this. Uh, when we look at vertex V1, edge zero one comes into it, edge one two comes out of it, but both edge zero one and edge one two agree in the orientation with the triangle. And so we, we combine these with the same sign as plus this, plus this, so we get zero. So that's, that's the kind of the hand wavy geometric picture. And it's basically just talking about an incident, theoretical incidence version of what you do when you multiply these matrices, which is basically take linear combinations of um, bits and pieces. Things just add up to zero. So this bigger example, the same thing is happening locally. And as Chris Parker points out, this means we have what's called a chain complex. For those who've heard of that before and you've probably um, if you've heard of it before you've probably saw this coming okay space killer that's good so let's formalize this a bit so we now fix a ring 
uh, all right, so community referring with identity or unit. And everything is going to be R modules. <clears throat> so here's a definition. So, so technically a code chain complex of R modules. So I might be lazy and just say a complex, but I mean a code chain complex of R modules. So it's a sequence. Right, so I should say, think of integers, the reals, z mod n um, as a ring, addition and multiplication mod n. Any field, sequence of R modules, and R linear maps uh, Peter Not quite sure what you mean by realization of the face inclusions, but you are getting there. I'm just trying to introduce these things uh, without going on the terminology just yet. So, what's the condition? For all, uh, Tommy, probably. So Z modules are abelian groups, and probably by default will work with a Z module. But sometimes, you know, Z mod two, all the rationals. So between the integers, Z mod two. And the rationals or the reals are roughly where we'll float. Um, okay, All right, so the DIs here are called differentials. So our examples from before, uh, we, we only had, say, Z, so let's over Z just for flavor. I had R4, R6, and R4 again. But I could just pad out with zeros. Uh, so delta zero, delta one from before. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Given any linear map of modules, we get we can pad out. A and so B and this being in the matrices and they multiply to give the zero matrix and we 
So R here is a ring, not, not just uh, the real numbers. Okay, so that's, so this is kind of the, the output that we want to get. Instead of just numbers, we're going to get cochain complexes. And then from that, we're going to get more things. Um, so, all right, there's a bunch more examples in the notes and a couple of definitions, which I don't need right now. But maybe I'll just talk about maps. All right, so, so whenever you have a gadget, you want to ask what are the maps between such gadgets. Complexes. Uh, complex means co-chain complex of our modules. So I might... Uh, that's fine. Let's call this phi collection of a linear maps one for each integer so delta i compose phi i is not that one I I plus one T I Okay, so we get a commutative square. Just phi uh, no. These square commutes. Uh, so I realize uh, we're coming up to um, the next lecture. So just some very quick comments. I'll get some examples of these at the start of the next lecture. So here's a philosophy. So a space up to whatever it means to be the same. It's going to give us, well, we can pick a triangulation or present it via triangulation. Yeah, I'm a little, still a little bit vague what that means. It's, it's not a single concept. So let's get constructing a, a combinatorial model. When we linearize to give us a cochain complex, and everything here works so with with maps, right? So we have a map of spaces. If we're clever, we pick everything such that there's a map of triangulations, or maybe you just like work with. Um, just with triangulations and the maps that work there and then you get from a map of triangulations you get a map of chain co-chain complexes and from this I'm going to extract algebraic invariance so groups or vector spaces so the, the co-chain complex level is somehow, like we saw earlier, just taking the vector space of dimension, say the number of vertices, 
is a bit too sort of sensitive to the actual choice of triangulation. So we start from space, we have a triangulation of it, which is somehow too much information, but allows us to get a Koche complex, and then we go back out and get algebraic invariance, which will be insensitive to this precise, the precise triangulation. Okay, so that's the rough idea of algebraic topology, how it's going to be in this course.